The 2014 Days of Remembrance marks the 68th anniversary of the first Nuremberg trial and the 53rd anniversary of the trial of Adolf Eichmann. <clears throat> Both trials set important precedents and raised significant questions about the nature of justice in the face of such enormous crimes. The challenges of justice and accountability continue to be enduring legacies of the Holocaust. Remembrance not only obligates us to memorialize those who were killed during the Holocaust, but it also reminds us of the fragility of democracy and the need for citizens to be vigilant in the protection of democratic ideals. We remember because we recognize the importance of preserving freedom, promoting human dignity, and confronting hate whenever and wherever it occurs. At this time, we pause to remember a tragic era in our recent history, when light was obscured by darkness and when the forces of evil were arrayed against our brothers and sisters. Six million Jews, among them one and a half million children, a third of the people of the covenant, were sent to their death in the gas chambers of Europe, Auschwitz, Dachau, Buchenwald, Treblinka, Bergen-Belsen, Ravensbrück, those very names evoke horror and terror. And yet we recall these names and the bar barbarous acts associated with them so that the travail of our brothers and sisters may inspire generations yet unborn to learn <clears throat> well the lessons of an evil time. Their memory must remain forever etched in our consciousness. As we recall their unanswered cries, we must pledge ourselves never again to be silent in the face of tyranny and injustice. We must transform grief into compassion. We must give evidence of our remembering them through acts of kindness and courage. Thus will our actions serve as monuments of the spirit to those who perished. I was four years, <clears throat> I was four years old on the night of November the 9th, 1938. That was the night of broken glass, Kristallnacht, the beginning of the end of the Jews of Europe. And until that time, my mother, my family, lived quietly in Berlin, where I was born. I had already lost my father, who died at an early age, when I was a year and a half old. My family had owned a ladies ready to wear store, and my mother soon was befriended by a couple and their small son. This association became a lifetime friendship, and more importantly, was the lifeline that led to my mother and me surviving Nazi Germany. On the night of broken glass, no one could have foretold what horrors and hardships the coming years would bring to millions of Jews and others. Throughout Germany and Austria that winter evening, synagogues, community centers, and Jewish-owned shops were set ablaze by the hands of hate. The next morning, the streets were a virtual ice rink of broken glass and sodden ash. The police stood by and did nothing. The firefighters rushed to the scene, to the property owned by Jews to instead protect buildings owned by non-Jews. Throughout Germany and Austria, 35,000 Jewish men were rounded up and sent to concentration camps and detention facilities. 7,500 businesses and 101 synagogues were destroyed. Nearly 100 Jewish citizens were killed. The German Reich imposed a large fine against the Jews of Germany, equaling the estimated insurance coverage of the destroyed and damaged properties. And the excuse for that night's action was the assassination of Ernst von Rath, a German official in Paris, killed by a Jewish teenager whose parents had been rounded up by the Nazis. That was an easy answer for the destruction that night. However, we know better today. The underlying issue of what soon became the systematic slaughter of innocent people was hatred. Every day I realized that I was one of the lucky ones. I mentioned earlier that my mother had received a lifeline in the form of a couple and their son who became like family to me. My aunt and uncle, as I came to call them, managed to arrange passage for us in 1939 out of Germany on the ship Scharnhorst from Bremerhaven. And at that moment, we became refugees, outward bound for Shanghai, China, the only place in the world that required no entry visa or indeed that cared who came ashore in that metropolis of the East. 
The port city of Shanghai was for many Jews after the terrifying events of Kristallnacht, the last refuge that could be reached without a passport, visa, or affidavit, unlike the United States and Canada, who had already closed their doors. All that was needed to make the journey was money for a ticket. We had to sell most of our possessions to obtain passage out of our home country. And because Nazi Germany only allowed Jews to take a few personal possessions, most stepped off the boats beautifully dressed, but penniless. For a short period during 1939, or even though we were in Shanghai, our exile status was politically not yet quite apparent. We had German, valid German passports, even though a red a stamp J was on the facing page of my mother's passport along with the red stamp Sarah above her name. You see, the Nazis identified every Jewish woman as Sarah and every Jewish man as Israel. You simply lost your identity. And then Germany passed a new law that invalidated our passports and removed citizenship from us. We became stateless persons, and that meant, especially in the first half of the last century, that we were simply non-persons. In the years between 1939 and 1941, approximately 20,000 European Jews fled to Shanghai, one of the few safe havens in the world where one could go to escape the Nazis. Unfortunately, my grandparents, like so many other elderly people, could not and did not believe the rumors of the coming horrors and chose to stay in Germany. Shortly after the end of the war, <clears throat> we were notified that my father's parents died at the Dachau concentration camp, and it was almost 50 years later on my first trip back to Berlin that I found out that my mother's father died at the Sachsenhausen camp in Germany. I was four years old in 1939, and my memories of Germany were non-existent. Shanghai became my home. I attended an English-speaking Jewish school, which was built for the refugee children by Sir Horace Kaduri, a wealthy Jewish philanthropist from Hong Kong. I made friends, played sports, was active in school activities. In general, we saw American movies, we read books. I was happy, as were my school friends. None of us knew that we were poor, nor did we feel deprived, because we simply didn't know any better. When World War II started in 1941, the Japanese occupied Shanghai, and being allies of Nazi Germany mandated that all Jewish refugees live in a poverty-stricken, filthy, and unsanitary area of Shanghai called Hongkyu. From 1944 on, sanitation, food, nutrition in the Hongkyu area were very poor. Malnutrition and disease were rampant, with many dying from scarlet fever, typhoid, or malnutrition. In total, 2,000 Jewish refugees died in Shanghai between 1938 and 1948, and of these, 1,700 in the Hongkyu ghetto, many from starvation. In this one square mile area lived 20,000 refugees as prisoners of war who were not allowed to leave the area without special permission from the Japanese. Overcrowding, poverty, hunger, disease, and yes, even prostitution became facts of life. And the greatest threat to the Jewish refugees occurred on July the 19th, 1942, when a German U-boat came into Shanghai Harbor carrying SS Colonel Joseph Meisinger, the infamous butcher of Warsaw, to serve as representative of the Gestapo from Tokyo to Shanghai. His mission was to pressure the Japanese to liquidate the Hongkyu ghetto of its Jewish inhabitants. The plan, never implemented, involved rounding up Jews in the synagogues on Rosh Hashanah, loading them on ships to either starve or to place them in concentration camps. These plans were realistic as the Japanese had already set up camps for thousands of Chinese prisoners. Fortunately, the Japanese Vice Consul Shibota was not interested in Meisinger's plans and the SS had no real power in Shanghai. Life in Shanghai was primitive. Staying healthy was a constant problem. Food was rationed and obtained mostly from a soup kitchen. And I remember fighting with my cousin about a piece of bread. After all, he was a growing boy, and it was felt that he should get more than I. When I arrived in the United States at the age of 13, I weighed 65 pounds. Head lice was a common occurrence among a lot of the school children, and I remember vividly having my hair cleaned with turpentine to rid me of the lice, and when that didn't work, having my head shaved. 
in the camp where my mother, aunt, uncle, cousin, and I lived in a small room. We ate there, we slept there, and we washed in there. And for all the years that we were in the camp, we had to boil our water for drinking water, heat our water for washing our bodies, and cook our meals on a little Chinese stove stoked with little egg-shaped coals. There was no flush toilet, and we were expected to use the honey pot that the other inhabitants of the lane were accustomed to using. The honey pot was a portable toilet, and every morning a coolie would come around to collect the excrement, which was later turned into fertilizer. Temperatures in the summer could reach 125 degrees, and in winter it was around the freezing mark with no heat available. We lived among the starving Chinese citizens in a city without benefit of running water and modern sanitation facilities. We lived this ghetto life all through the war, including bombings by American planes in 1945. The unexpected happened this time. On July the 17th, 1945, shortly before the war ended, our ghetto became the target. U.S. Air Force B-17s intended to knock out a Japanese military radio station located near our ghetto. Unfortunately, they missed, bringing death and destruction into our area. I was in school at the time, and to this day can remember crouching under our desks for protection. Finally, after what seemed like hours, but was actually only two minutes, we heard the all-clear siren. It was a couple of days before we were reunited with our parents. A month later, on the 15th of August, after the United States dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Emperor Hirohito announced the unconditional surrender of Japan. And on the 2nd of September, President Harry Truman officially proclaimed VJ Day as the Japanese surrender was signed aboard the U.S. battleship at Missouri at 10.30 a.m. Pieces here and shouts of joy rang through the ghetto. It was like a dream and it seemed unreal. When peace came to Shanghai, so did the realization of what had happened in Europe. Rage and anguish was intense as people discovered their families and communities had perished. News that millions of the Jews had been killed in German concentration camps trickled into Shanghai. Shanghai Jewish Chronicle printed a series of articles about how Jews had been gassed to death and then incinerated in camps. Shutters of fear and horror rattled through the ghetto prayers. Meetings were held in all the synagogues to honor those who had perished. People were filled with annoying anxiety about the fates of their relatives in Europe. Most had heard nothing from any of them since the outbreak of the war. Fears deepened as lists of survivors were posted and published. My mother and I left Shanghai for the United States in April of 1947 on a converted American troop ship, the SS General Gordon, and arrived in San Francisco on May the 17th, 1947. And the family that sponsored us lived in Peoria, Illinois, and that is where my life began in America. Our first glimpse of paradise was when we stopped in Hawaii on our way to America. Imagine turning on a faucet and having a drink of water without having to boil it first. On May 17, 1947, we passed under the Golden Gate Bridge, and it was an unforgettable morning. The sun was shining, and after having been seasick the better part of the voyage, we were all out on deck, waiting for our first glimpse of America. Everyone cheered, and then we cried. It was hard to believe we were here at last, and then we cried again for all those who didn't make it, for our countless relatives and friends who had ended up in Hitler's ovens. A few years ago, a good friend of mine, also a Holocaust survivor, was telling her story. And in it, she mentions the three Bs, bed, bath, and bread. Listening to her speak of the three Bs reminded me of the day that we left Shanghai. I thought my bed would walk out by itself because it was so infested with bed bugs. Would the time ever come that I would have a clean bed and one that I didn't have to share with my mother? It took several more years before we could afford separate beds. The second bee related to a bath. I finally got to take my first bath upon our arrival in San Francisco. But again, it would take a couple of years before we had our own bathroom, not one down the hall, that we shared with the other tenants of the building. And the third bee, of course, was bread. The food was so plentiful and so rich that we were given here. At 13, I soon became a pimple-faced teenager. <laughs> 
You all know the word zakor, remember. Remember and never forget, and do not let others forget. Always remember that the impossible, the unthinkable happened, and unfortunately could happen again. The Honorable Michael Blumenthal, former Secretary of the Treasury and current director of the Berlin Holocaust Museum and a member of our Shanghai survivors, detailed the lessons to be learned from our Shanghai years. Our Shanghai history contains many lessons. Lessons about the strength of human spirit, about hope and courage and giving, giving your best, even when times are darkest, about the importance of community, about dignity and cultural heritage, about our Jewishness and about ourselves. And more widely, our historical experience shows that appeasement of bloody tyrants does not work, that violating the rights of minorities does violence to us all, that each citizen has a civic responsibility to oppose intolerance and prejudice toward any religious, racial, or ethnic group, to stand up and be counted, and to have the courage to speak out, even if it's politically incorrect. We live in dangerous and volatile times and face challenges that promise to be with us for many years to come. Dictators still threaten the peace. Intolerance and fanatic hatred still abound. And the persecution of innocent minorities remains a lamentable fact. As you were told in the introduction, life has been very good to me here in America. I was married for almost 50 years to my husband, who was an attorney in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Twice I was president of my temple. I was executive director of the Jewish Federation and just retired September 30th because I'm going to be 80 this Saturday. <laughs> and I thought it was time to move to Chicago where my children live. Survivors are concerned about how the events of our lives will be described when we are no longer here to personally tell our stories. We have memories of our children, of vibrant and vital Jewish communities, of grandparents, parents, brothers, sisters, aunts. We each have our story to tell about surviving. And we have our own history of building new lives we want to pass along to the new generations. The stories of our experiences, we want to be sure that they include stories of Jewish life and culture before the Holocaust. And there are a couple of achievements of survivors that I always like to focus upon. The first is the strength our parents had to pick up the pieces of their lives that had been so cruelly interrupted and go on with life. And the second deals with the external factors after the war. Both America and the state of Israel offered us freedom and opportunity. After losing so much, we were deeply grateful for the generosity of these nations. We can look back now and be proud of what we have given in return, not just our work and our successes, not just our most precious possession, our children and grandchildren, but our spirit, our example, and our honor. We are respected today in this country and throughout the world because the community of mankind knows that we Holocaust survivors have something very valuable to impart. The experience of the Holocaust was unique, but has great meaning for all who treasure the free world, a place where every human being is safe to live. There is no answer to Auschwitz, no answer to hatred, brutality, and murder. There is no answer, only questions why. Why did so many innocents have to die? Out of the ashes of death and destruction, out of the flames that engulfed us, came the survivors whose eyes have seen the horrors and whose ears have heard the screams. They tried to silence us, but our voices are still heard. They tried to destroy us, but we would not die. The chain has not been broken. The sheep led to slaughter are now lions, proud and strong. The yellow star of shame is now the courageous badge of life. They killed the Jews, but Judaism survives. They burned the Torah, but the words endure. The six million who perished, their voices silenced forever, left us a legacy we must remember. We are the survivors who lived to tell the tale. We are the remnants who were, bitten, were witness to the world. Thank you.